Welcome to the Red Light Report, your number one source for all things red light therapy, where you will learn how to optimize your health, wellness, and longevity with the power of photobiomodulation. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Belkowski. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Red Light Report. On today's episode, we have the lovely Dr. Tina Moore. This has been a long time coming. But just a quick background on her, with nearly three decades of experience in the medical world, Dr. Tina has made her mark as a leading expert in the holistic regenerative medicine and resilient health spectrum, and traditionally and alternatively trained in science and medicine as both a naturopathic physician and chiropractor, she attempts to bring a unique perspective to those wishing to build a more robust foundation in their health and well-being. She has her own podcast, by the way, the Dr. Tina Show podcast, very popular. Go check it out on Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify. She helps others improve the resilience and metabolic health through multiple online offerings, which we'll touch on. She has a very educational and robust social media. Go check her out on Instagram at Dr. Tina and, uh, of course, her podcast. She also helps doctors build their online businesses organically, transition their practices out of the insurance model, which I can highly resonate with and gain more time, money, and freedom. Above all, she's a fierce advocate for medical autonomy, personal responsibility, a kettlebell devotee, which I love, and a mother and dog lover. And interestingly enough, Tina, I'm going to give you this little inside scoop, is I first came upon you because my mom, like me, is very much into this holistic health, uh, longer than I've been alive probably, And so she's always looking on Instagram for people she appreciates their information, education, can believe in. Before we ever met, she's like, you got to check out this Dr. Tina. And this is in the middle of COVID. And you're this very staunch person with your beliefs and how things had been uh, culminating. We can kind of talk about that. I'd love to get your uh, perspective. So I checked you out, loved your information. And it was so coincidental because I think within the next week or two, you started following BioLite. You know, I hadn't talked to that ever happened. So it was just kind of this coincidental thing that happened, but you started following Bioloid and sometime down the road, a week or two after that, I think, I don't know if you reached out to me or I reached out to you, but we kind of started conversing in because you were interested in red light therapy and all that stuff. And, and so here we are, long story short, but without further ado, welcome to the show, Dr. Tina Moore. Thank you. Oh, that's crazy. Isn't that funny how that works? I think people are supposed to meet and you just have these, yeah, I'm sure you do that where you think about somebody and then you wake up the next day and or you know, you run into in the grocery store or whatever. It's it's when good people connect. It's yep, yep. It's kismet. Yep. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Your red light units have been really life changing for me in the past year, and I am so excited to talk to you about it today. Definitely, we'll we'll get to that. But before we do, like I mentioned, your major name, at least largely in the last handful of years, because of your fervent belief in this whole COVID nineteen thing. And so I'd love. Not necessarily in hindsight to what you think of it now, but when it first began and then maybe three to six months into COVID, give us your mindset and your perspective as things began to unfold. And it's like the government's saying this and we're starting to get isolated and sequestered and things are starting to come into play. Now we have to have these vaccination shots. So give us your mindset as things initially began with COVID and as things started to come into play, what were you seeing from your perspective? Okay, so just real quick background. I had long haulers for a long time out of college. So I almost got pulled out of college completely and got super sick from cytomegalovirus, which is a common virus that hits people. And it hits. It only really lingers if you're immunocompromised. So clearly I was not well. And that ruined and changed my life. <laughs> you know, it, it ruined and, and saved my life, actually, I should say. I became a naturopathic physician because of that journey. And then in the years leading up to COVID, I was working way too much. I had way too many things on my plate. I was enjoying a lot of success clinically and career-wise, but I was flying all over the place. I was everywhere. And I would get hit every season with pretty gnarly pneumonia. So I'd become really accustomed to dealing with upper respiratory infections and what they would turn into. I also have a very special interest in metabolic health because I think that's the root cause of everything. And you can't fix anything unless people's metabolic health is in order. And most Americans, I think the last study that came out was looking at 2018 data. It showed that 94% are cardiometabolically busted and 6% are sound. And that stat had to have been much worse by 2020. Long story short, when this started, I was like, well, I know how to help. 
I know how to help this. And so I started talking. I had a couple of videos go viral and I got a bunch of followers and I took a bunch of hate and a bunch of heat and a bunch of venom. And I really, I mean, I was telling people to eat meat and lift weights and go out in the sun and go for walks. Like it wasn't anything radical. I was taking major hits and I thought, well, this is weird. And then I thought for sure public health people are going to come out and start speaking some sense, right? Like beyond the lock yourself in your house, wear your mask, be afraid of your neighbor narrative. I figured there had to be some logic in, you know, vitamin D, zinc, vitamin C, all the same stuff that any smart person ends up taking every fall anyway, like to prepare for winter. I have a whole arsenal I do. And I shouldn't say smart, I should say in the know, but you know, your mom probably knows this. My mom knows this stuff. Like this is this is take care of your kids medicine. And I was met with so much venom and vitriol, even for daring to mention the slightest things. And I knew at the second that public health shut down the gyms and did not want to mention vitamin D or zinc or C or exercise or sunlight or heat shock proteins or anything that people could do on their own accord, I something smelled off. It smelled really off to me and I wasn't having it. I don't know how else to put it. I just thought, you know what? If this is my hill to die on, so be it. I am not shutting up. I have information. We are being lied to. And this is going to get really, really bad. And I could see it. I could forecast it. And I have a little bit of a spidey sense. So I saw what was coming. And I was like, you guys, stop falling lockstep for this. Like They're just eroding away your morale slowly but surely. So you say yes to the next thing. And uh, as a naturopathic physician, our first oath is obviously to do no harm, but one of our tenants in naturopathic medicine is doctor is teacher. And I was like, well, I'm going to teach. And I conveniently had stepped out of practice the year prior. So I didn't have a practice that they could really come after me for, you know, I wasn't, my income wasn't contingent on my practice anymore. I was, I had other things going. And so I was like, I guess this is my hill to die on. I'm, I'm not shutting up. And every single thing I tried to tell people came to fruition. The first one being is that we're all going to get exposed. And that these little paper masks and cloth masks aren't aren't it. And if you want to protect yourself, so be it. But it's really not that protective. And this stuff is aerosolized and it's everywhere. And or whether we believe in viruses or not, I knew everybody was going to get exposed. And probably, de- well, it all depended on their immune status and their immune status depended on their metabolic status. And that's all I was really gunning for was trying to help people do the things necessary to improve their metabolic status. Because, you know, and I know And I have no idea why my profession of naturopathic medicine, by and large, turned on me, which was weird. I thought they of all groups would be the ones to save the day. Without your metabolic health, you don't really have immune health. And there's no medication or treatment in the world that can actually help you improve your metabolic health more effectively than your own lifestyle choices. The food you put in your mouth, the way you live your life, the sun you get, the exercise you get, the muscle mass you have. And so I thought, you know, the only way out is through. And that was my message. And it was not popular. (laughs) I mean, to a small group, it has been, but man, it's been a ride. And I just figured, here we are. We're three years later and everything I said has happened. And yet they're still mad at me because I was right about it. So I don't know. I wasn't trying to be on my high horse. I was genuinely trying to help people because I'd been there. And I was like, this is how we avoid pneumonia. This is how we stay healthy. This is how we get through this. And I had COVID. It was gnarly. It was rough on my husband. It was less rough on me. I wasn't trying to make light of it. I wasn't trying to make light of people were dying. But I think hundreds of thousands of people died because the government failed to execute. And public health experts failed to help. And so here we are. And everybody else got scared and got quiet. It's kind of baffling to me. I I have no idea what my prediction would be. I just know at one point I was looking at data on effective therapeutics that we did have, and it would cost the U.S. government about $6 a person for a little baggie of prophylactic help of a variety of things. And uh, that just didn't happen. So that's, I don't know. I I think it was just stubbornness after a while. And then, you know, the attacks just fueled me. I was like, you guys are just creating the monster you're trying to destroy at this point because I'm not going to shut up. (laughs) Well, guys, the holiday season may be over, but you can still save big. We've had this for some time now. BioLite has what's called bundles. So simply go to the BioLite website, BioLite.shop, go under products, and there will be a tab for bundles. With each of these bundles, there's three of them, you save 20% off on the entire package. For example, we have the Beauty Bundle, which includes a Shine and Stand, a Guardian Plus, 
Plus and the Longev Revive Cream. So that bundle of three products, you save 20% off the entire package. There's the Recovery Bundle. That includes the Recharge Plus panel, the Guardian mouthpiece, and then the Longev Recover Cream. And that Recover Cream is just like the Revive Cream, except it has added CBD oil infused into it. That package of three items all comes at 20% off. And then the last bundle, which is the most versatile bundle in the sense that you get to pick and choose what products you want. You get to pick and choose from the Recharge Plus panel, the Restore Plus panel, or the Matrix Full Body Mat. And then you get to choose between the Guardian and Guardian Plus. And then you get to choose between the Revive and the Recover Cream. It also includes the Shine and Stand, so you get to choose between black and silver. By purchasing those four products in the Ultimate Bundle, you save 20% off all of the products. You also save 20% off shipping. So literally, the entire package and shipping is 20% off. So if you're ever needing some red light therapy products and are looking for a discount, just remember the bundles are always 20% off, 365 days a year, no coupon code necessary. I don't remember if it was you on, on um, Instagram or, or someone else or somewhere else. And this chart's been, been around quite a bit now. It's been circulated. The chart that shows the cyclical nature of like the, the cold or, or the flu that happens every you know, during the winter months, you know, it comes and it goes and every year it comes and it goes. And then in, for some reason in 2020 or 2021, there's like none of it. It went down to like zero in those charts. And it's just like, okay, where did it go? Well, we all know where those numbers got ushered to for one reason or another. So, so there's all these things that add up to your point, whether you're connecting the dots in the background or otherwise, but I mean, everything they suggested was pretty much backwards, right? Like to your point, there was no nutrition recommendations. Obviously, they didn't recommend to go outside. Quite the opposite. Please stay inside and watch the news and, and, and listen to us. Mandatory vaccinations, which we could spend a whole series of episodes on, on, on how you could look at, at it from a freedom perspective or how it was rushed out or who's really to gain from this. I mean, th there's just a lot of things that go into any time we're being forced to do something. And, and so I really appreciate people like the two people that come to mind during the 2020 pandemic is... You and Dr. Leland Stillman are two people, like you said, that you're going to die on your hills. You're going to provide the public with real information, whether they want to take it or leave it or spit it back at you. You need to have people like you, you and Leland that are out there, voices of reason to counteract being brainwashed by the powers that be. So I really appreciate you and uh, Leland for really putting your yourselves on the line and your 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 name on the line for the health of others. So I appreciate that. Thank uh, you. On Instagram, you've got some cool videos of your morning routine. <laughs> Movement. You're in the morning sunrise, which I do as well, and barefoot and got some music or something else going on. Explain your mo morning routine and why you do it. I wish I could say my morning routine involved more outside, but we don't get too much good sun here until a little bit later. Well, we don't get any good sun here for many months of the year. I live in Oregon. <laughs> so there's a problem. Okay, with you. But I'll tell you, the red light saved me. So in the morning, I used to do a, a sad light, you know, or whatever, happy light, whatever you want to call them. It was that like 10,000 lux light that you'd put adjacent to you while you drink your coffee. But then you sent me the red light unit and I do that along with my 10,000 lux light. And that was really, really helpful through winter. And then I discovered using it in the evening helped me significantly to the red light in the evening was really, really beneficial for me. But in the morning, I just try to get moving. I try not to be too stressed out. I'm not great though. I do turn on my phone and look at my Instagram and people always say, you know, these influencers are like, look at my magical morning. My morning isn't that magical. But I do try throughout the day frequently to get up, get moving. I know I have ADD or ADHD or something. And it was always a superpower until I hit perimenopause and then it became a bit of a distraction. And so for me, getting up and getting moving is critical. So I'll go for a walk. I'll go outside. Even if we just get a sun break, I'll run out barefoot and hula hoop and just try to get some movement in, get my feet on the ground, even if it's the cement or the muddy, whatever, you know, just to get some grounding in, get my mitochondrial going. Uh, I love sun so much. I can't believe I exist in the winter. I don't think I would have gotten through this winter without your red light. I was, it was a rough winter for me. I promised myself I will never live another winter in Oregon again. <laughs> I can't do it. I'm too old. I can't do it anymore. But I, in the summer, I am out there early with my cup of coffee, sitting in the sun, getting my horizon on. I get out there as much as I can going for walks. 
I found too, as I've aged, and I don't know if this would be interesting to your listeners, but I'm sure there's some women in my age group. And this has always been the case, but it really became noticeable. The harder I work out, the fatter I get. And so I have had to find this nice balance of walking, like I call it my lollygag walks. I might look at some birds or stop to smell the flowers. It's really not like a brisk walk with an agenda anymore. It's just kind of me outside on my farm, dilly dollying along, petting my dog. And then I do strength train two to three times a week with kettlebells. I've had so many injuries, though, the past year or so that it started with an Achilles injury last summer. I'm just really about the heavy lifting and resting. I don't do well with this metabolic revving kind of workout where there's, you know, I used to do a ton of kettlebell snatches and it was really metabolic. I just don't do well that way. I never really have. I don't think I have the adrenal glands for it. And so I've been able to stay lean even as I've aged through just walks and lifting heavy shit. That seems to do it. So that's kind of, I know that wasn't my morning routine, but that's just kind of my day as I go. I'm just trying to think of the lovely things I do to charge my mitochondria. Why do you think you gained weight with a higher intensity exercise? Is that like uh, too much cortisol or stress or something? Yeah, I think so. I think it's just, a. I think it piggybacks on my already high levels of cortisol from life. You know, it's been a stressful time. Getting attacked viciously for years on end while I was in it, you know, I was really holding my own. But looking back on it in retrospect, it I have PTSD from that. I mean, they were, they still are trying to wear me down and I won't have it. But I got to say, though, I've been looking at some other folks who really held the line and a lot of them gained a lot of weight and look much more haggard for the, (laughs) I, I definitely look older than I did in 2020. But I feel like through my biohacking or whatever, my good living, I kept myself reasonably maintained. So I'll give myself that. But yeah, it's, you know, people telling you that you're the devil for multiple times a day for days on end, years on end, that gets tiresome. But, you know, in the end, it's the truth is a sword. Sometimes you're just going to have to swing the sword and it cuts and so be it. Yeah. Being attacked, that, I mean, that'd be like a low level, like a low grade perpetual stress or like cortisol and that's what kind of what we preach and that's kind of your clinical sweet spot is treating people that whether it's work or relationships or financials it's like people always seem to have a perpetual low level stress that's what raises the cortisol that's what messes up our metabolic health and all that so yeah being attacked consistently daily i can't fathom what that would do to your stress levels so so to your point kudos to you for maintaining what you could through all of that I think initially when when you got the Restore, kind of to circle back to red light therapy, when you initially got that full body uh, Restore Plus, I think you were putting it into your sauna. Did you successfully do that? No, I tried. I did not. You'll love this. So I had, I tried. My husband's an electrician. I thought he could rig it, but he wasn't as interested in rigging it as I was because he didn't, he doesn't understand how it works. You know, when people don't really understand and you try to tell them, like if they don't understand what mitochondria is, it doesn't mean much to them when you tell them oh my God, this is it. Like, this is everything, you know? (laughs) So he's less interested, but he did have a pretty severe bone contusion. It took a chunk of bone out of his tibia with a wench. He was cinching up a truck onto a trailer and it snapped back. The wench at full tension snapped back onto his leg. Anyway, he doesn't complain. Two days later, it looks like he's got compartment syndrome. And I'm like, uh, this is bad. And I'm either going to have to open you up myself and lance it, or we're going to have to go to the doctor. But either way, you have to take off your work boots because he had gone to work every day. I'm like, you got to, he's a blue collar guy. I'm like, you got to put your feet up and put this red light on. And, you know, I come back. He's so funny. He's, he's a real, he's a farmer, you know, he's, he's a man of simple words. And I come back a few hours later. I told him, I said, let it cool down, turn it back on, put it back on, let it cool down. I was being aggressive. I know that's aggressive. And I was like right up against the tissue that he could, as much as he could tolerate. And I came back an hour or so later and he's like, look, look at my leg. And the swelling had gone down significantly. And, he, you know, having it elevated had helped somewhat too. But he was like, this thing really works. <laughs> <laughs> Was so- people, the people that aren't watching the video, uh, Tina's uh, showing off the shine. I think that's what she used with her husband, correct? The, the yeah. BioLite shine, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and since, I'll just make this quick. My daughter stole mine. She was using it for, I can't even remember. My mom stole another one. So I had to buy more from you. 
<laughs> so they're, they're hot little units around my family. Anyway, that panel, love the panel, didn't know what to do with it. I was like, okay, it's it's on the ground. It's heavy. I didn't, honestly, I didn't feel good about putting it on any of my doors because it's it's a heavier unit. So I had it on the ground. I was sitting in front of it. I would sit on my uh, meditation pillow and sit in front of it. And as winter progressed, I got colder and colder and I was less inclined to take my clothes off. The beautiful thing about my house, my husband built our house and the main level where our master bedroom is, the floors are heated. Mm. So he's got some kind of like hydraulic water heating system. So if I turn the heat on at the right time of day, the floors are really warm for evening time. When we when I take we take our showers and we get ready for bed, my dog's usually up there by then in bed on her warm bed that's on the warm floor. So I moved the red light unit upstairs out of my studio in the basement, put it next to my dog. And every single night, I just take my shower, come sit next to her as scantily clad as possible. It's just she and I, we flip on the panel and we get our red light on because she's a kind of a red blonde dog. So I figure the light's penetrating. Yep. And then I use, she keeps blowing her ACLs out on her rear legs. It's been a whole thing. But this shine unit has been so helpful that with that so we you so basically it's the big panel shining on us and then we've got the little unit directly on some acre pane either on her or me this this is our nighttime routine and we already had a nighttime routine because every night sometimes i work all day and i don't get to connect with her much and especially if it's rainy and we don't get our walks in so every single night without fail i sit down for 15 20 minutes and have time with my dog like i pet her i talk to her i give her love she's very cuddly she needs it she gets depressed if she doesn't get it and we have our together time and so i thought well what we should just make it a red light session (laughs) so we just red light the whole time that's our that's our evening together and sometimes i'll just turn the light on and leave her, you know, like let her if it's if I'm doing something else. So she gets red light every single night. I get it most nights with her and she's living in luxury. And she's got her her hind legs really helpful for the knee injuries, the shine unit right up against her knee. I'll do medial and lateral. So I'll do five minutes on each side. And it's really, really helpful. Did uh, she have surgery on the ACLs at all? No, because so my background's in prolotherapy and regenerative medicine and like PRP and stem cells. And I looked into it and I talked to some of my holistic vet friends. And the bottom line, it was same same with humans. If you have surgery as a young person, your chances of getting arthritis later are very high. So she was either going to deal with arthritis later or she was going to deal with arthritis later. And we live on a farm. And I thought if I can get her back to some semblance of good. I mean, she's got weight bearing when she's good. She's got weight bearing ability on both. So it started with one leg. I rehabbed her. I did prolo on her. I did stem cells on her. I did all kinds of injections on her. You know, I don't know who people can go see for this because it's my dog. So I'm allowed to treat my dog. I'm not allowed to treat anyone else's dog because I'm a naturopathic doctor, but I can do whatever I need to do my dog. I got her good on the one leg and then she got stuck in the mud and knocked over by the other dog that lives on the property and her other leg blew out. So now she's got both back legs that are a little warbly. So we've got some work to do now that it's spring. So it's a series of injections, red light, rehab. Injections, red light, rehab. And then if I inject her, I red light her right away just to supercharge what I just put in there. I don't know if it'll work, but... I was just going to say, did you know that there's some pretty interesting research on stem cells and red light therapy? I have. I didn't do it with the stem cells because I was afraid... Well, what I used was exosomes which are not stem cells. They they hold the secretory packets of of stem cells. And I wasn't sure if I would damage them in any way, shape or form. So I red light the leg, then I inject it, then I red light it again once it's in there. But I was thinking about putting the vial right up against the red light and supercharging it. Mm. That, w- that would make sense. It's worth a try. This is a good idea. I could even put... Because th- when you do Prolo, you use dextrose. It's just sugar water. So I could actually potentially even charge that up. It might structure the water some. I don't know. Red light would. So yeah. one of the things I'll never forget from Dr. Gerald Pollack's book, Fourth Phase of Water, is with all the studies, one of the things he's bringing up was, was how to structure water. Well, the thing that structures water most of visible light is red, but infrared light structures water more than even red light does. And you can structure the water more by increasing the intensity and or increasing the duration that the water is exposed to the infrared light. So to your point, you could use a combo of red and near infrared, but again, according to Gerald Pollack, structure it with some infrared and you can use the shine, you can use the panel, but, but putting that uh, that vial up there 
if you're using the panel, I'd put it like three, six inches away just to mitigate any EMFs. But other than that, basically, like if you have the shine, put it right against the shine LEDs with infrared for, for a full 10 minute session if you wanted to. That's awesome. That's brilliant. Yeah, if, I like what it. What will it do by structuring the water? Maybe maybe the, the uptake or the integration is smoother and faster and more effective. We don't know. We're just speculating here, but that's kind of the thought process. Well, what you and I were talking about offline is in regenerative medicine, this is the other reason I was so adamant about COVID is, and, and me getting the truth out if I could, as well as I could, as I knew it anyway, the microenvironment matters, right? So the environment matters, the macro environment, the micro environment. And so in my head, a lot of times when I'm using red light is I'm just trying to induce and infrared. I'm just trying to induce change in the micro environment, even if I can't penetrate to the depth that I'm trying to get to. If you could supercharge the saline and the dextrose and whatever else is in that syringe, then the more the better, right? It, because it would probably get the communication pathways going in the region where you inject it is what I'm thinking, if that makes sense. Sure, I'm, I'm thinking about like talking to the tissues with my needle and then I'm trying to get it to wake up and induce. That's the whole premise of prolotherapy is you're inducing the body is being asked and called upon for a secondary healing response that it didn't really get the first time. And so you're inducing this modulated inflammatory response, if you will. I mean, you're trying to induce some kind of controlled inflammation so that it'll heal. Exactly. And so that makes total sense. And that was the same with COVID was I was like, we know that isolating people completely tanks out. I mean, it's unrelated, but the, in my head, I was thinking community, community, community. I was like, they're going to shut down the gyms and then they're going to shut down the churches because community and being around other people, A, is clearly necessary for the soul, but it's also how your immune system practices. I knew the second they let everybody out, we were going to go through wave after wave after wave because all they were doing was immunocompromising everybody by locking them down. I was trying to hug and kiss and uh, anybody I could get my hands on <laughs> that looked healthy yeah, no. <laughs> out on the street. I'd be like, come on, bring it in. Give me a hug because I wanted everybody's microbiome all over me throughout all of COVID because I knew we were it was becoming less and less. And I actually have a friend who is big in the microbiome world of science. And he was saying that in the stool samples they were looking at, that between 2020 and 2021, significant reduction in diversity of bacteria in the stool and the microbiome just from the isolation alone. So you can imagine the implications, the negative implications of that on our immune systems. We're losing diversity. We've probably lost a ton and it may not come back. Because now everybody's immune system, not everybody, but a good portion of the human species immune system has been altered through vaccination. So is that something if you were aware of it during that time during COVID, if you were taking pre and probiotic capsules, would that mitigate it as far as like maintaining your gut microbiome? I know that's not the complete immune package per se, but would that have helped mitigate some of it? Because I think to I your don't know. it's kind of the inverse of the hygiene hypothesis or whatever it's called where you don't want to sanitize every single thing you're surrounded by. Otherwise, you don't get exposed to your point. Thus, you don't get the stimulus. So then when you are stimulated, you do get sick because you're not prepared. You don't have the resilience. So yeah, was, was there any way other than like your way of touching everyone that you could to, to build up your immunity? Was there any other way to combat that necessarily from a supplemental or other external source? I don't think so because... Pounding, you know, singular strains or even multiple strains of probiotics doesn't necessarily give you anywhere near what what living does, you know. So, like, if you eat something, your microbiome will shift within minutes to hours based on what you're eating, you know. And it's just wild. And we need interactions with people. I saw a documentary the other night about a musician who's been in music touring the world since the '60s. And I will not say who it was, but there was a glimmer of it in there from his girlfriend was talking during the documentary and they'd been together for 20 years. And she basically said that COVID, the fear of COVID really locked him down for a hot second there. And he was very depressed. I mean, this guy's in his 70s now, right, when COVID hits. And so he's always been on the road. He's always been on tour. And now suddenly he's not working. He's not touring and he's scared. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Here's somebody who has traveled the world consistently for decades upon decades, who probably has one of the most robust and interesting and diversified microbiome ever, just from that alone. Far better than mine, staying isolated out here on the farm or even isolated in the suburbs or isolated in the city, right? 
And yet he's scared of something that he probably, I don't know, he's still alive. So clearly he survived. <laughs> but you see my point? I was like, this yep. is how little people understand how their immune systems work. Like your immune systems need practice. They need to work out. They need to be insulted. Not in a so much sense that you need to get sick all the time, but you will get sick all the time if you're isolated all the time because everything you come into contact with, you know, your immune system doesn't know what to do. But if it's practiced, it's like, oh, yeah, no big deal. We can skate through this. And I, it just was so interesting to me how all of this was handled and how people responded. Didn't mean to go off topic there, but it's really been sure me out. Story. No, that, that paints the picture to your point how, I mean, I'm sure he didn't, he didn't know he had the most robust microbiome with all of his travel. I mean, that's probably not the mindset he was in. The fear got to him. I wonder if he got the vaccination that did, did that. Uh, oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. The person that didn't need it or <laughs> so to speak. Well, and then there, I don't know if you saw, I don't have the name offhand, but it is on my sub stack. If people go check out my sub stack, there was an Israeli PhD researcher who actually went through all the data. He, Peter McCullough, and a couple others went, uh, other, some other Israeli scientists went through all the data and they showed with proof, with all the data, they showed that those who got vaccinated, it was one to one. The vaccine did, his whole argument was, does it really stop severe injury or severe illness and death? And the answer is no. You were just as likely through all looking back at all the data from the last few years. And he shows you all the studies that they went through. Their conclusion was that it was a one to one. Your chances were just the same without it as they were with it. Nobody wants to hear that. And what a devastating blow. But and, you know, they'll never publish it or share it out. But this was their conclusion after a smart group of people got together and just scrolled through all the info and all the data points. Well, so not just a one to one, but then like. The obvious elephant in the room is the negative consequences that you now have if you got vaccinated. And we're seeing reports of athletes or very healthy people either dropping dead or getting severely sick, whether it's their heart or otherwise. And of course, the doctor's not going to say it's because of the vaccination per se, but we connect the dots. And I think that's what we know. Hap I mean, they're young, healthy people. Um, yeah. He talks about that. He gives you some statistics, which are pretty grim. A significant amount of people had to get vaccinated for one person to not be severely ill. And a significant amount of people had to die for one person to be saved. So I don't I don't remember the exact numbers and I won't misquote it here, but it's on my Substack and it's on YouTube, too. I can't remember the guy's name, but you can go through my Substack to find the YouTube. And it's pretty. Yeah, it's pretty damning. But I don't know why this information won't come to light because God forbid they be wrong and admit right. it. Well, and then you have the whole continent of Africa. What's the percentage of people there that got vaccinated and like they've Fine. been touched? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is a great point to bring up because I was just talking to my strength and conditioning coach about this. We were talking about the racial disparities in America and how that impacted outcomes with COVID. And definitely folks that were in the African-American community, folks that were in the Hispanic community got hit harder and d fared worse. Now. The big argument that I was getting at the beginning from people, I was getting screamed at, you're racist, you're racist, because these are the people that are on the front lines working and you're just out there gallivanting around without a mask on, which was not the case, but whatever. People make up whatever they want to believe. And then the other argument was, oh, it's it's genetic. This is why they're getting hit harder. They're having a genetic reaction that's more severe to COVID. And then Africa happens, right? What did Africa have? A ton of sun. They're all metabolically sound. And they had ivermectin readily available, right? So who knows which what it was, but and they a very low vaccine. But I mean, they were doing great before vaccines rolled out. They were doing great. They've been doing great this whole time. Africa wins the pandemic, <laughs> clearly, like hands down, Africa wins. And the problem is, is because of racial disparities, we have an African-American population that is plagued with obesity and heart disease and diabetes in our country. And same in the Hispanic community. We have a lot of diabetes leading to cardiovascular disease. And, you know, and then the obesity, it's like chicken and egg, right? Once, you, once you're dealing with metabolic dysfunction, it's very difficult to lose the weight. And that now you're in this vicious cycle. And that is like the, you know, vacancy sign for COVID to come in and raise hell. That phenome right there, that's like the hot mess of inflammation that most Americans are. And so that happened. But in, I'm sure racial disparities, economic disparities definitely played into these folks being in that position in the first place. But it wasn't because of their genetics. Exactly. Africa so what, won. Right. So what was it, race or was it like to your point, 
kind of scooting back to your points of micro and macro environments, was it the race backslash genetics or was it the environment they're living in, i.e. America and all of the fast food and stress that comes along with that? I mean, you and I know, and I'm sure the audience, a lot of the studies where there's indigenous populations that get exposed to the diet or the lifestyle of the USA, and all of a sudden they're very healthy indigenous peoples, they quickly become stricken with metabolic diseases and otherwise. So to this conversation's point, the environment surely caused a lot of the illnesses secondary to the virus coming in. I mean, like you said, it was opportunistic given the environment of America. Yeah. I wish somebody would do a study. Maybe there are some. I don't, I haven't seen any. I would love to see what, like the closer that somebody is racially to their roots, meaning how many, so my husband has a lot of Cherokee Indian in him. He does not do well with ultra processed carbohydrates. He does not do well with alcohol. He turns into a raging alcoholic very quickly. And he's been very vocal about this. So I'm allowed to share it out. And I, when he finally, because he's got these high cheekbones, and when his mom finally told me that he's got a lot of Cherokee in him, I was like, oh, well, no shit. No wonder why you, I mean, he just packs it on in the midsection the minute ultra refined carbohydrates are in his life. He eats less of them than I do. I mean, he's really strict about his diet. And I, ha- I remember having a chiropractor friend in school who was half Native American, and he was having a lot of troubles with his health, and he was having a lot of issues with alcohol towards the end of schooling. And I was like, dude, you're not supposed to eat the white man's food. Like, you do not do well on alcohol and ultra-refined carbohydrates. And that's all our country is anymore, is these ultra-refined carbohydrates that are just garbage. Forget all the chemicals and everything else they put into it to blow out your dopamine circuits. The ultra-processed nature of it is so devastating, I, I think, especially to folks who are closer culturally to their roots. So I think, you know, Mexican folks coming out of Mexico there's not a lot of intermingling of bloodlines yet, right? They're predominantly Mexican folks marrying Mexican folks. And those folks do not do well on ultra-refined carbohydrates. Or especially, I would be interested to see what the GMO modification of corn has done. It's all that, you know, I mean, it's a long discussion, but like no one's talking about that part is just, I learned this in school, eat ethnically what you're closest to. So if you came from an ethnic background that never ate apples, for instance, I don't know, don't eat apples, like stick more closely to your bloodline of the country and the locations you came out of and see how you do just as a suggestion, you know, and every time I bring this up again, people are like, you're racist. I'm like, how how are we supposed to get past this? And we can't talk about this stuff like this is real, you know, I said recently on my podcast that I've had to take my Mexican patients off of corn because their diabetes was so rampant. It was melting their joints. They were becoming crippled. They were unable to work. They were going blind. They were having kidney disease. And I'm like, you have to stop eating corn. And I know that's so culturally a part of their meals every day, you know, and my daughter who helps me with my podcast, she was like, mom, that's racist. She's 23. So everything's racist. Right. And I was like, no, it's not. I, these people are going blind and I'm trying to help. I'm, I'm trying to share information. I'll be the one to take the hits. Fine. I'll take it. Call me racist. Like I'll be the one, but I'm going to spread information that I hope is helpful because I don't know about you, but every time I have worked with any population, when you give a human being good information and their brains are on, they're like, thank you, that's helpful. I'm just trying to empower people always with knowledge, whether it's hard to hear or not. But the food in America is killing people. Folks come in from other countries or they're a couple generations in and it's devastating to them. Yep, those are all good points. And that's kind of a good segue into another, I guess, question or thought process I had for you. Oh, uh, you've kind of spoken on it already, but just to get your thoughts on nutrition and exercise and or for mitochondrial health, like how to optimize those or like what are some hot topics right now in the realm of nutrition or supplements? And then you kind of spoke on exercise and movement, but is there anything else there you have thoughts on? And then along with red light therapy, any other hacks or tools that you love to integrate for for mitochondrial health? Yeah. So for food, I try to eat really simply. I try to eat one ingredient at a time. So I can always go back. I've, I kind of have a sensitive gut. So I can always go back and think, well, I know, you know, I had these three things in my bowl. What set me off if if I end up with a headache or a stomach ache or whatever? I could put it to, or pain. I get a lot of musculoskeletal pain from my gut. So that is very helpful. I think just simplifying your food down. People always ask me for recipe books and I'm like, I eat so boring. My <laughs> my food is so boring. I literally had a bowl of ground beef, 
two eggs and some sour cream. That's, you know, that's my breakfast. So I'm pretty simple. I try to eat a lot of ruminant animal, mainly beef. I really love beef. Beef has changed my life. I encourage everybody if they're Beef is not the killer they have said it is. Red meat is not going to kill people the way they have said it would. That was propaganda from the 70s and 80s to sell statins, in my opinion. But that's a whole other yeah, topic. Yep. I'm not big on plant-based. If people want to eat plants, I, and I always say, I, I'll start with this. I don't care how anybody eats. It's no judgment. I just personally don't do well with plants. So I'll eat squash, but squash really are fruit disguised as vegetables. They're not vegetables. So I'll eat squash. I'll eat some potatoes. I'll eat fruit and I'll eat beef. And that's about it. I eat, well, I mean, I eat full fat dairy too. I try to go for, you know, A2 or raw, but I'll eat full fat dairy. Sure. So that's that's about what I eat. I feel way better. Uh, a lot of my health issues have resolved and I have a much happier gut now and much happier bowel movements, much happier skin, all of that. Let's get a little background on your um, ethnic background. So like the audience can kind of picture what's your background with what you just told us you eat. I am a mutt to the core, and I come from a long line of people with type 2 diabetes and autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of sitting on that hump for years of just, I think I was in my early 20s when I was diagnosed with my first autoimmune condition. And it's ITP, it's idiothrombocytopenic purpura, where your body eats your own platelets. So out of nowhere, I was bleeding profusely because my body wasn't, my body was eating all my platelets. That was fun. <laughs> was in that. that was right after actually that long cytomegalovirus when I had a really bad bout of cytomegalovirus. The coming out of that was autoimmune disease. It's the other thing that's happening right now with COVID, a lot of folks are not coming out of it. They've got long haulers, et cetera. And it's like, yeah, well, how you go into it dictates how you get through and how you come out. And that's not to say that everybody who went into it was unhealthy going in and still didn't get long COVID. But a lot of this comes down to metabolic health. In fact, my friends that are treating long COVID right now, like that's their bread and butter at this point. All of them have told me the same thing. If we can get the person's metabolic health in order, the long COVID goes away. Or the people who were metabolically healthy never ended up with long COVID. So I know, I mean, again, that was like from day one, I kept trying to tell people, get your metabolic health in order. So anyway, as far as my eating goes, my family, I was raised up on like <laughs> pretty bad Midwestern white trash food. It did not help my gut. And as soon as, you know, lots of Crisco, lots of omega-6 oils, I, we call them seed oils now. And as soon as spray on Pam became popular and my parents started buying, I can't believe it's not butter and margarine products and like all of that, everybody in my family got fat and everybody got sick. I watched it happen in front of me and I was like, oh. And I thought it was meat. So I quit eating meat in in like defiance. I was like, I'm going to become a vegetarian at 14. That was a disaster. It was a complete disaster. It went on for a decade. I was sick as a dog. That's when I ended up with a cytomegalovirus. It was a total disaster. So I don't really like chicken. I think chicken harbors some really nasty bacteria. I do like eggs. I'm trying to get my husband. We're on a farm. And I'm like, dude, where's my chickens? I need to be raising my own eggs. I don't know why we're dilly-dallying on this. But Lots of eggs, lots of beef. Ruminant animals, the reason is they have extra stomachs so they can turn grass and garbage and whatever else into really nutritious, highly absorbable nutrients for me. And I appreciate them for that. What and kind of animals? Ruminant. So multi-stomached animals, multi-chambered. Yep, yep. So elk, cows, sheep. I don't eat a lot of sheep though. I don't love the way they taste. Pigs and chickens are monogastric. So when they consume crappy omega-6 oils, it stays crappy and it ends up in their tissues as crappy oils. But when cows or other ruminant animals consume whatever, they make the fats much better at the end of the day in their tissues. And they also turn the food into highly bioavailable zinc, carnitine and creatine and all the good stuff for our brains to make our brains happy. And after decades of anxiety, depression, and health issues and autoimmune disease. Just give me a steak. I'm calm. I'm happy. <laughs> I feel strong. I feel good. My skin calms down. My bowel movements are happy. Amen. So I encourage, I encourage anyone thinking about it. I'm not like full carnivore. I have a metabolic revamp toolkit on my website where I just share how I eat and why. And it's short and brief. But if people want to know more, they can find that there. I just encourage people to eat real food. That's like they know what the ingredients are. They know where it came from. Make it at home. We eat 99.9% .9 of our meals at home. And it's a bit of an effort, but 
man, you really do enjoy a superior level of health that way. Yep. Totally agreed. What about for exercise or movement? Is there anything so, cutting yeah. out or interesting you want to share on that that side of things? Uh, no, really boring. <laughs> <laughs> Basics, deadlifts, squats, presses, push. I've been working on my push-ups and pull-ups a lot lately. That's been really fun. You lose them fast, but they come back fast. So that's been Definitely really, really fun. It. Yeah. <laughs> but man, I can crank them out right now. That's that's sure is fun. And the walks, nothing cutting edge, nothing exciting. I do love my red light though. Like I said at night, that's like my big recovery tool. And it's my circadian rhythm setter. So the little shine light is actually what I use in the morning. And I put it adjacent at maybe a 45 degree angle to my eyes as I'm drinking my coffee and whatever I'm doing, reading or whatnot in the morning. And then I do my big panel at night. And that's really helped my sleep quite a bit. I actually notice my heart rate variability improve significantly too on my aura ring when I do it. So there's something for sure there. I was going to ask you about if you wore anything with biometrics, because I don't know if I shared this with you or if you knew about that we did a study, BioLite did a study, I guess it's two summers ago at this point, and we actually used the Restore Plus panel. So the one you have, so everyone that was in the study, they used a BioStrap or they had a BioStrap. So they were in the study. I'm sure my audience is tired of me telling people about the study, but let's carry on here. Yeah, um, I want to hear it. They just measured biometrics for the first four weeks. So they just collected data, which are normal without red light therapy. Then they introduced eight weeks of full body sessions. Was it Monday through Friday or was it every day? But regardless, 10 minute full body session. So five minute front of the body, five minutes back of the body at about six inches, red and near infrared light. And again, morning and evening. And then... The last four weeks, no red light therapy, just the biometrics to see like how long were the lasting effects of red light therapy, what happens when you take it away. And so the main purpose of that study was to look at sleep. That was kind of what we were going into, like what happens with your sleep when you do full body red light therapy. And the numbers turned out to be that they were so close to be statistically significant, but they just weren't. So we couldn't make those claims that a full body session statistically significantly increases X, Y, and Z. Had we extended the study another two to four weeks, we probably would have reached those numbers. But the kicker is the cool thing we attained from that study that we didn't expect was every time you do a 10 minute full body red light therapy session, your HRV goes up like 144% or something. Oh, like that. wow. Every time you're doing red light therapy, Tina, like you're tapping into your parasympathetic nervous system, you're decreasing stress virtually instantaneously. It was speaking to you without even knowing that knowledge or that information. And then your, was it Aura Ring? Was mm -hmm. kind of backing that up with HRV as well. So it's kind of interesting to hear anecdotally, like from you, it's cool to get the information in the study, but to hear people like you out in the real world, so to speak, getting those type of results is, is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, mine likes to hang out when I'm stressed. It hangs out in the 20s. It's bad. And it's, I mean, it sucks. I can't get it up. If I do everything right, and I don't know what that always is, because sometimes I do everything right and it doesn't change. But if I seemingly do everything right, a little hack I'll give the audience, eating a little bit of protein and carbohydrate before bed has really helped as well with my heart rate variability. I think it keeps me from having any kind of hypoglycemic crash in the middle of the night. And I, I do like my continuous glucose monitor quite a bit. So I, I play with that too as a biometric monitor. Anyway, everything's better with a little bit of food right before bed. <laughs> Interesting. But even when I do everything right, I might get it in the 30s, maybe the low 40s. And when I red light religiously, I didn't realize twice a day I should do that. I should do like full body panel and check it because it goes up in the 50s. So it doubles. Oh, it's almost doubles. That's huge. Yeah. And just so people know, because I know I'd love to get your thoughts. Everyone's HRV, like it's not comparable from person to person, right? Right. Um, right. Which I guess I still don't necessarily understand fully. So I had a similar experience to you, but with grounding, like when I introduced grounding mats, like I have one on my desk, my feet are on it right now. I have one where I eat. We now have one as, as a mattress cover on our bed and our pillowcases. I went from basically grounding 0% of the day to grounding a significant portion of my day overnight. And my HRV responded dramatically similar to you in regular therapy. Uh, so mine was sitting in like the low 60s, probably stressed from work, not getting enough exercise, not the best circadian rhythm. But when I introduced grounding, it went up into the 80s and 90s, like overnight. So not quite double, but all I did was introduce some grounding technology. I'm not even grounding outside. I'm just using this technology. Uh, but my awesome. wife, like her lows are in like the 110s, 120s. 
And like when, so we use um, bio strap because we got it from that company. And so she, she uses it when we, when she sleeps and on her good days, it's in the one forties and maybe one fifties. So all of that to say, like you have different numbers. I have different numbers. My wife has different numbers. They're all drastically different numbers, but they don't compare across people. I yes. guess when I'm trying to drive home, correct? Yes, that is correct. It's not comparable from individual to individual. It's more looking at what your numbers are. Do you know why that is? I guess that's, I'm curious. I don't know. And I, I don't know. We need a, we need a HRV expert on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I do know that in the twenties, you're pretty screwed though. I will say that. I do know everyone I've, t- everyone I've talked to, I'm like, okay, if they, if they have any HRV experience, I say, check this out. Here's my numbers. And they go, ooh. <laughs> when I tell them it's in the what 20s, they're like, well, that's like what, bad. If your, what if your max cap physiologically is like 80 or 90? Like, we don't know, or you don't know, or like, will you ever attain triple digits? No. And I, I, I wonder about, I have a friend who's so stressed out and travels constantly and is a ball of stress. And his are in the high, like 120 to 130, you oh. know? Exactly. And that he can't be, I mean, he's much younger than me, so he's got that going for him. But I'm like, I don't know. And I know a woman who is in her 60s, who you would never guess it. She, a dear friend of mine, she looks like she's in her 40s. Beautiful woman and hardly exercises. I don't know. She she just has some good genes, some good longevity genes. And her HRV is in the 20s mm-hmm. all the time, no matter what. So That's who like, knows? Yeah. I guess in the end, if you're tracking it consistently, you know what lifestyle habits increase it or decrease it, and that's what matters because then you can change accordingly. So you know when you do red light therapy or you have certain foods or your circadian rhythms on, I want to say on fleek, but I'm a little too old to say that. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, you know what improves it and you know what wrecks it. And I think that's the most important part. Same for me. It's like if I compare myself to my wife, I'm I'm never going to feel good about my HRV. Um, Right. This morning I woke up, it was like 20, 25% higher than its average. And I went on a longer trail run because of that. My body's ready physiologically, so it's ready to take on those stresses. So you just use the information and it still baffles me that the numbers are so different from person to person, but I guess I'll have to let go of that. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if we know or if anyone knows because I haven't seen that explained well anywhere. I've just said, I've heard it said, you know, don't get too hung up on it because it's- right. We're not comparing person to person. We're comparing you and your yep. data. But I, yeah, I wonder. I don't know. I think that it's really interesting information, though. But I don't always feel as bad as my ring says I should. So sometimes I joke that my aura <laughs> ring is shaming me. My husband thinks it's garbage. He's like, throw that away. It makes you feel bad. If you wake up and you feel good, then you're good. So I don't There's know. There's no truth to that because I'll wake up and my HRV is like really low, but I feel good. But because it's low, it's like, oh man, I shouldn't like. I shouldn't exercise as hard today or I should take it easy. So I almost let it get to my head. And I think I do less sometimes because of it, even though I shouldn't. You know what I mean? So I don't know. Well, there, mine always tells me to take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's always like, you old hag, you better. St-. I just, you know what I do? I do everything this way. I cycle it. So I haven't had an aura ring on for like a month and a half, two months. I just knew life was stressful and I didn't want to know. So yeah. I cycle it. Oh, and then other times I'm interested and I, I follow it. So there's these huge gaps in my data. Totally. Well, Tina, are there any other um, mitochondrial hacks that are either unique or that you, you are in love with that you think makes a difference with, with your health and wellness? That's a good question because I, I try to share this wherever I can. I'm a huge fan of this concept that really jives with naturopathic medicine, which is your ability to withstand hot and cold temperatures is very much contingent on your vitality. So like it's a it's a good marker. If you can't handle hot and you can't handle cold at all and it makes you super uncomfortable, even feel sick, your vitality is probably pretty low. And that's that's my favorite biomarker is vitality. And nobody ever talks about vitality. And I think that a lot of these tools that we have at our disposal are just that. They're tools to stoke our vitality. So we can get really hung up in protocols and timing and distancing and cold ice plunges, which I swear make me feel like I'm going to have a heart attack every time. I don't have the vitality for that. So for me, ending with a cold shower or a cool shower or whatever I can handle that day based on my vitality and what I'm feeling is is it. So your exercise, right? You could base it on your ring or you could base it on how your vitality is feeling. And 
all the things that we talked about that are good for us, all of those things increase vitality. So good nutrition, interacting with others, socializing, sharing microbiomes with the right people because microbiomes are contagious. So you don't, definitely don't want to be swapping them with really unhealthy people. Sunlight, movement, laughter, red light, all of that. Those to me are just vitality stokers. So I don't know if that brings a different slant for your listeners. Sometimes that helps people be like, oh, yeah, that kind of like brings the common sense. We were talking about our parents and, you know, our grandmas, like they didn't have fancy tools and gizmos and measuring devices. They just knew where vitality was at. And so that's it. Like, don't do the things so extreme if they feel really hard on your vitality. And then just use all of these tools to nudge you on your way there so that you just feel better and stronger. That's what I would say. Oh, that's a great answer. I like that. Are you familiar with the concept of Ikigai from the Japanese? Yes. Yeah. So I just, I just read a book on that, which I found pretty fascinating. And it's just the mindset of finding something you're passionate about. It's basically what wakes you up in the morning, what fills you up. And it's a combination of what you're passionate about, what you can work for, how you can help others. But it spreads into other aspects of life too. And it's just being happy and excited about what you do. They talk about the blue zones. And of course, this came out of, is it Okinawa? I think so. You know, the blue, blue zone. zone. Well, like what all blue zones have in common outside of the obvious of nutrition and, and movement is community and feeling like you're uh, contributing to society or helping others. And I think that gets lost in the shuffle of biohacking or mitochondrial health too. And you've said it multiple, multiple times is, is connecting with people and socializing and, and contributing or, or helping people. I mean, especially during COVID when you're isolated, I think a lot of people obviously lost the social connection, but then the contribution factor as well. If you're not able to contribute, you don't feel like you have a purpose and that can get into your psyche and that that's a whole other discussion. But um, yeah, great answer, Tina. Purpose. And remember that mitochondria are bacteria at the end of the day. Nobody wants to talk about that. And we, if we are doing things to kill bacteria, imagine what all the hand sanitizer and Lysol did to everybody's biome including their own mitochondria. So these are bacteria that talk to each other and they talk to the bacteria and other people. So it's all about like we're humans, we're animals, we're fancy mammals with opposable thumbs. That's the reason I love the red light truly at the end of the day is because it feels like the sun. I, that's when people yep. say, why should I buy one? I'm like, because it feels like the sun. <laughs> that's enough. I don't have to give them any other information. I'm like, it'll make your wounds or your everything will heal better and it feels like the sun. And they're like, okay. So easy a sales pitch ever. Yeah. <laughs> but but it's true. I mean, that that kind of encapsulates it in a nutshell. I mean, you're just taking wavelengths of the sun that do particular things to your body and it feels good and you get energized. So what more could you ask for? Yeah, that's it. That's the best thing about red light. Well, Tina, I appreciate your time. I think it's time for you to get outside because I think you said you had sun over there in Oregon for the first time in who knows how long. Yeah. Uh, so So just quickly, because you did mention your metabolic revamp toolkit. So I just want you to be able to kind of to your horn, because I also noticed on your website when I was looking through, uh, you have like a supplement store. And then also along with that metabolic revamp toolkit, you have a foundations of overcoming pain naturally, uh, a program. So kind of talk to the audience, you know, what you have to offer on your website, social media, and just where people can go to learn more about you and from you. Yeah, thanks. Oh, it's funny that that's up there still. So I, when I was leaving practice, I did a four week program with a group of people. And that is the recordings from that. And it is literally gold. It, if you have pain, it is gold. It is the culmination of over a decade in practice of doing nothing but dealing with people in pain and all of the lifestyle factors that need to be handled from all the things we just talked about, basically, from a deeper dive level into pain. So that that course is up there if anybody's interested. I, it just sits there and collects dust. <laughs> I never push it, but it's a good one, man. It's I was listening to some of it recently. And I was like, damn, that's gold in there. <laughs> and then I've got my I podcast. Yeah. The Dr. Tina Show is my podcast. I, you were on it. I'd love to have you come back on and we can talk about more fun things and red light. And my metabolic revamp toolkit, it's just the quick and dirty. It's inexpensive. It's just a short program of PDFs and eBooks to help you make sense of all of it. When I talk about metabolic health, people say, what is that? What does that mean? What is it? Why is it important? And it's all in there as well as how I eat and why. I, again, I would never tell anybody how to eat. This is how I eat and why. And there's some recipes. There's ways to assess your metabolic health at home with printouts to take to your doctor if you think that you might be struggling with it, which I guarantee if you're 94% of U.S. adults, you are. So it's really just a handy guide to introducing yourself to the concepts around metabolic health and how to get a handle on it. Excellent. 
Well, everybody, go check those out. They're on her website, drtina.com. Just go check out her website. A lot of cool information. You can find out all the little her programs and um, supplements that she offers and other information. Tina, appreciate you coming on. I really appreciate everything you've done. You know, since I've, you know, come or you've been in, in my horizon as far as, you know, finding you on Instagram and just following your information, you as an educator, who you are as a person, I just really appreciate it. So thanks for being you and thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate your friendship as well. Thank you. For Dr. Tina Moore, this is Dr. Mike Belkowski. Thank you, everybody, for showing up and listening to this episode. You guys have a fantastic week. Thank you for listening to the Red Light Report. If you like what you heard today, go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes and other podcast platforms to help spread the word so other people can learn about the many health, wellness, and longevity benefits of red light therapy. If you're looking for more educational content, check out our Instagram page at biolite.shop and our YouTube channel, Biolite. I'm Dr. Mike Belkowski, and I'll see you on the next episode.